Operations Masters. A long time ago when Windows NT4 was the server of choice, we had one master domain controller, the primary domain controller or PDC, and this server held a copy of the SAM file that contained all of the user accounts in your domain. Then we had backup domain controllers or BDCs that were secondary read-only copies of the PDC. These BDCs could authenticate users, they could log on, they could access their files and go about their daily work, but they relied on the PDC to update them with any changes. So the PDC was in charge back then and the BDC were the followers. If the PDC was down, you're in trouble since you couldn't make any changes. When Active Directory arrived on the scene in Windows 2000, things changed and Windows moved from a centralised PDC model to a decentralised model using multi-master replication where changes could be made on any domain controller and replicated to all of the others. This meant that Active Directory took us away from having to rely on a single server being available, the PDC, in order for us to administer our domain since changes could now be made on any domain controller and then simply replicated to the others. If one of the domain controllers was down, the others could still authenticate users and make configuration changes. Well, that's actually not entirely accurate. Active Directory certainly does allow us to make changes to any domain controller, and that's a huge plus, but we still do rely on certain domain controllers being available for specific tasks. Active Directory uses the concept of operations masters for critical operations that require a particular server to take charge of specific tasks. Now, the term operations master is technically the correct term to be using nowadays, but back in the early days of Windows 2000, you might have heard it called the flexible single master of operations or FISMOS, as it was often referred to as. In fact, you'll also hear it called domain naming FISMO or Domain Naming Operations Master. So take your pick, all of them refer to the same thing, but Operations Master is the official term used in Windows Server 2008. You see, even though we now use a decentralized model where any one of potentially hundreds of domain controllers in our network can make a change, there are still certain tasks that would cause the Active Directory database problems if every server could do it. Now that's why we have Operations Masters, Servers which hold additional powers, if you like, that are required to oversee the management of certain tasks. So what is an operations master? Well, an operations master is simply a domain controller that holds one of five additional roles. The schema role, the domain naming role, the RID, PDC or the infrastructure role. And it's important to understand that like with the global catalogue we talked about in an earlier video, the first domain controller you install in the first domain in your forest will assume all of these five roles. The first two roles, the schema and the domain naming role, are referred to as forest roles, which means that in your whole entire forest, there'll only ever be one machine holding that role. So if our first domain controller in our first domain was this one, then our server would hold all of the five roles, including the two forest roles, the schema, and the domain naming role. Whereas the remaining three roles, the RID, PDC, and infrastructure roles, these are domain roles. And with domain roles, there will be one server that holds these three operations roles in each domain. So in this example here, we have four domains. And since we only have one domain controller in each domain, every single server here will hold at least three roles. The RID, PDC, and infrastructure roles with only the first server holding all five. Now these roles can be transferred to other servers as well, and we'll see how we can do that shortly. So let's go and take a look at what these roles do. Now the first role we have is the schema role. The Active Directory schema refers to the structure of the Active Directory database. In other words, what fields are contained inside the Active Directory database. Now there's only one server that holds the schema operations master role in your entire forest. So even if you have multiple domains, the server that holds the schema role will be required to be up and running and responding when the schema needs to be modified as this is the only machine that can write changes to the schema. 
and it will be responsible for replicating these changes to all of the other domain controllers in the forest. We can take a look at the Active Directory schema using an MMC snap-in tool, but since the schema isn't something that Microsoft really advised you to be mucking around with, you'll notice that if we go and click on Start and then choose Administrative Tools, there's nothing in here that'll let you access the schema directly. So to access it, we'll need to click on Start and then type in Reg Server 32, followed by the Schema Management DLL. And just so you can see that there, that's spelled S C H double M G M T dot D L L. And if we typed it incorrectly and we hit enter, you'll be able to see that the registration of the DLL was successful. All right, now we'll go and click on start again and we'll type in MMC and we'll hit enter. And that's going to open up a blank MMC console. So we'll go to the file menu and we'll choose add remove snap in. And now we'll select the second option here, which is Active Directory Schema. We'll click Add and then OK. Now over here on the left side of our console, you can see we have Active Directory Schema, so we'll expand that. And beneath this, we've got two subfolders, classes and attributes. Now, whilst the topic of this video isn't an in-depth look at the Active Directory Schema, to help you understand the schema a little bit better, Let's take a brief look at it. So if we select classes, in the middle here, we can see a whole list of Active Directory classes. And in fact, if we scroll all the way down here, you'll recognize some of these. You're going to see things like the user class, one of the most common classes that you as an administrator is going to be using. So if we right click on that and choose properties and then go to the attributes tab, we can see down here, all of the attributes that are valid for the class of user. And you're going to see a lot of things in here that you'll recognize, things like when a user's account expires, how many times they've entered in an incorrect password, and things like their user principal name. In other words, all of the things you'd expect to find in Active Directory users and computers, when you select the properties of a user account, you're going to find it in here, and a lot more as well. Now, if we click Cancel and then select the Attributes folder, in here, you'll see a list of all of the attributes in our Active Directory schema. And as you can see from this list, there's a lot of them. So what does this all have to do with the Schema Operations Master role anyway? Well, when you install an application that integrates with Active Directory, and an example of that would be Exchange Server 2007 or ISA Server 2006, both of which modify the schema to add their own classes and attributes that are required for those applications to function. So since they need to modify the schema, you'll need to have your Schema Operations Master up and running or those applications will fail to install because the schema can't be modified if the server holding the schema role happens to be down. Now remember, you only have one Schema Operations Master server for your entire forest. So when you need to make schema changes, you'll be affecting the schema for everything in the forest, not just one domain. Now in smaller companies and those with one domain, this normally isn't a problem. But in larger companies with lots of domains, making schema changes will need to have those changes replicated to every domain controller in the forest, and that can take some time. So a simple solution to overcome this problem, at least while you're rolling out your domain controllers is, if you know that you're going to be installing ISA server or Exchange server or some other product that needs to extend the Active Directory schema, then perform the schema extension as part of the installation as early as possible, even if you aren't planning on installing the application for a few months. That way, your other domain controllers won't be hit for a performance penalty later, and you can jump straight in and install the application without having to wait for the schema replication to occur. OK, so we know that the Schema Operations Master is required to extend the schema. But what if that server's down? Well, we can't extend the schema for a start. And this also means that since the schema won't be updated, you won't be able to replicate anything new to the other domain controllers, and that new whiz-bang application you wanted to install, well, you won't be able to.
In the event that we know that we're going to need to install a schema extending application, but we anticipate that the server holding the schema operations master role will be down, say for maintenance, then we can simply transfer the role to another domain controller. Although, in my opinion, it's pretty unlikely that you'll want to shut down your schema master for maintenance at exactly the same time you want to extend the schema. In the sane world, however, the only real reason that you'd want to transfer the schema operations master role to another server is if you were decommissioning the old schema master server and replacing it with a nice shiny new one. So in this situation, we'd transfer the role to another server, build our new server, then either leave the schema role on the server we just transferred it to, or transfer it back once the new server is up and running. Now, if you don't know which server currently holds the schema role in your company, you can right click on the Active Directory schema and choose Operations Master. And from here, we're able to see which server is currently holding the schema master role. So in this case, dco1.winstructorlab.com is holding the schema master role in our network. So to transfer this role to another server, we'll cancel this and we'll go and right click again on Active Directory schema and we'll choose to change the Active Directory domain controller. Now we're currently connected to DCO1 and here you can see that it defaults to any writable domain controller and it's unlikely that you'll want to let Active Directory just simply choose another domain controller at random. So we can manually select a domain controller from the list below and since I have another domain controller here called DCO2, I could choose that one. But since by default, this screen here only shows the current domain, which is winstructorlab.com. If I wanted to transfer the schema master role to another server in a different domain, I could select the drop down list here and then choose a different domain, such as my child domain here, london.winstructorlab.com. And then I could select DCO3 from my London child domain if I like. So let's do that. We'll select our other domain controller here dco3.london.winstructorlab.com and we'll click on OK. Now since I've just connected to another server that isn't the schema operations master role holder, we're told that we won't be able to make any changes to the schema using our DCO3 server here. And that's to be expected since you'll recall that the only domain controller that can make changes to our schema is the schema master, which at this point is still DCO1. Okay, so now that we've changed the domain controller that we're connected to, we'll again go and right click on Active Directory Schema and we'll select Operations Master. So here we can see that our current Schema Operations Master is still DCO1. And if we click on the Change button, then we'll be transferring the role to DCO3. But to do this, you must be a member of the Schema Admins group to perform the change. So we'll go and click on the change button and we'll be asked to confirm our decision. So we'll do that by clicking yes. And now our schema operations master is now on DCO3. And we'll now be relying on this server to be up when we need to make changes to the Active Directory schema. But what happens if DCO3 suddenly dies in a heap? Well, two things. Firstly, we can't modify the schema if the server's down. And secondly, we won't be able to transfer the schema role to another server since we can only transfer the role gracefully when the server's up and functioning properly like you just saw. So in situations like this, where the server that's holding any of the operations master roles is unavailable, we can seize the role and give it to another server that way. Now it's important that you realize that seizing a role from another domain controller is a decision that you should only make as a last resort. And Microsoft themselves only recommend seizing roles from domain controllers that are going to be removed from your network permanently. So bear that in mind and plan to transfer the role if at all possible, or plan to build a new domain controller to replace the old one if you do decide to plug that failed server back into your network. So if the server that's currently holding a role can be brought back up in some way, shape or form, attempt that first, then transfer the role. If it's absolutely dead and beyond repair, you have no choice but to seize the role. So the first thing you'll need to do when seizing a role 
is to open up a command prompt and connect to the computer that you'd like to take over as the holder of the operations master role. So we'll click on start and we'll fire up a command prompt and then we'll need to use the ntdsutil command to seize our schema master role. So we'll type in ntdsutil and we'll hit enter. And you can see our prompt changes to represent the fact that we're now in the directory services mode. Now at this point, you could type in a question mark and you'll be able to see what options you have available if you get stuck. So we'll type in roles and we'll hit enter. And our prompt changes to show the first server master of operations maintenance mode that we're now in. Now I might add, at this point, we're not actually connected to this server with ntdsutil, even though we're running the command on this server. So to connect to our server, we'll first have to type in connections, or we could just type in con here, since this tool also supports partial commands, and this is going to get us into connections mode. And now we'll need to tell the utility which server we want to connect to. So we'll type in connect to server dco1. Now this connect to server here is actually what you'll need to type in. The word server here isn't the name of the server, it's actually the command itself. So on your servers, you'll need to type in connect to server, followed by the name of the server itself, which in my case is DCO1. So we'll hit enter. And we're now connected to our server, as you can see, using the credentials of the locally logged on user, which in my case is the administrator account. All right, now that we're connected, we can type in quit and that's gonna take us back to the previous menu. Now from this point on, we can type in a question mark and hit enter. And here you can see the options we have to either seize the various operations master roles or to transfer them gracefully as we saw earlier using the Active Directory Schema MMC. All right, so let's just assume that our London server DCO3 that now holds the Schema Operations Master role has just blown up and it's unsalvageable. So to seize the role now and bring it back to this computer, we'd simply type in seize schema master. And when we hit enter, we'll get a message asking us if we really want to do this. Remember that this is serious business. It means that we're intending never to have DCO3 back in our network ever again. So if it's truly dead and beyond repair, we'll click yes. Now, something important to notice amongst all of this output is that even though we chose to seize the schema operations master from DCO3, because in my case, the server DCO3 is still up and running just fine and a valid connection exists to DCO3, our attempt to seize the role was not really needed. So instead, ntdsutil simply transferred it to our server DCO1 the graceful way. Now, if we want to seize or transfer one of the other roles, we'll simply type in a question mark and you'll see the syntax for each of the other roles. So up here, we could choose to seize the infrastructure master or seize the naming master, the PDC, the RID, of course, the schema, but we can also transfer the infrastructure master, the naming master, the PDC, the RID master, and the schema master as well. So it's a pretty easy process using the command line, and the process is exactly the same regardless of the role that you want to seize or transfer. So from this point on in this video, we'll concentrate on using the GUI. Just bear in mind, if you want to seize a role, you'll need to come in here into the ntdsutil on the command line to do it, as the GUI is only useful for transferring roles. Now, a final point to make about the schema role before we move on is that the only time the schema role is really required to be up and running is when you want to extend the schema. If this server's down for a good period of time or you shut it down, it really won't make any difference to your normal day-to-day -day operations unless you want to extend the schema. So if it's down, it's down. It doesn't really matter until you want to extend the schema. So if you do plan on installing a schema extending application, you'd better make sure that the server that holds this role is up and running. All right, well, let's move on and we'll take a look at the other operations master roles we have in Windows Server 2008. The next role we'll look at 
is the domain naming role. The domain naming operations master is responsible for adding and removing domains in your forest. Like the schema master, there's only one domain naming operations master in your entire forest. And again, like the schema role, the server holding this role could indeed be down and day-to-day -day operations will still function normally. So when domains need to be added or removed, the domain naming operations master needs to oversee that change. It's also in charge when you want to rename a domain so it can ensure that the name is unique. It's required to add or remove application directory partitions, which are special partitions on domain controllers, which can be replicated to other domain controllers. And it's also required for adding or removing cross-reference objects, which is what identifies the name and server location of each directory partition in the forest. So to see which server holds the domain naming role, we'll click on Start and choose Administrative Tools and we'll launch Active Directory Domains and Trusts. Now if we right click on Active Directory Domains and Trusts at the top here, we'll choose Operations Masters. Now here we can see that the domain naming role is currently being held by DCO1, which is the server that we're connected to here, so obviously we can't transfer it to itself. So we'll close this window and we'll again right click on Active Directory Domains and Trusts and we'll choose to change the Active Directory Domain Controller. Now since we're currently connected to DCO1 which holds our domain naming role, we'll select another one from the list here, we'll choose DCO2. Again, we could choose another domain if we like. So we'll select DCO2 and we'll click OK. And now we'll right click on Active Directory Domains and Trusts again and we'll choose Operations Master. And again we can see here that the domain naming role is currently being held by DCO1. So to transfer it to the server that we're now connected to which is DCO2, we'll click Change. Are we sure we want to do this? Absolutely. And we can see that the change was successful. So DCO2 has now taken control of the domain naming master role, so we're free to shut down DCO1 and do whatever we like with it since DCO2 is now in charge when it comes time to add or remove domains in our forest. So again, if DCO2 here happens to be down, we won't be able to add in any new domains, remove domains or rename them until we bring this server back up or transfer the role to another server or seize it if DCO2 is dead and beyond repair. The next role we'll look at here is the PDC emulator role. This is a domain role which of course means that one server in every domain in your forest will need to assume the PDC role. The PDC emulator operations master really has two functions. It's designed with Windows NT4 domain controllers in mind because it serves to trick Windows NT4 Backup Domain Controllers or BDCs into thinking that there's a real Windows NT4 Primary Domain Controller or PDC on your network. The Windows 2008 server that holds the PDC emulator role will authenticate Windows NT logons and password changes. It'll also control replication of domain changes to all of the other Windows NT4 backup domain controllers that you might have left over in your network. Now even if you don't have any NT4 backup domain controllers on your network, the PDC emulator server is still there and it's still responsible for controlling password changes. So what happens is when a user's password is changed, this password is sent to the local domain controller which accepts the change and passes it on to the PDC emulator, which could be on the same server or another one, and that's then responsible for authorizing the change. If it authorizes the change, then that new password is then replicated to all of the other domain controllers. Now, because there can be a time delay during the time that a password has just changed and the time that all domain controllers have had that password replicated, whenever a user logs on, the domain controller will always check the PDC emulator just in case there's been a password change that it doesn't yet know about. And this is important 
since if a domain controller doesn't yet know that that user's password has changed, since it hasn't had that change replicated to it yet, and this user attempts to log on, then the domain controller won't accept the user's password. So this checking in with the PDC emulator first will alleviate that problem that a replication delay might cause. Now the PDC emulator does have another special power as well. It handles account locking or unlocking as well as high speed password replication. Now generally speaking, replication of any Active Directory object doesn't happen quickly, but the main two exceptions are passwords and account lockouts. Now let's face facts here, if you enter in your password three times unsuccessfully and your account is locked out, what good is your security if you can attempt more logins against another domain controller which hasn't yet had time to be notified that your account's locked out? Now similarly, if you request a password change and the help desk connect to their local domain controller and change your password, and you try to log on with a password that hasn't been replicated to your local domain controller, then you'll be denied access too. So that's the role of the PDC emulator. Besides replicating changes, it's the master of all changes relating to passwords and account lockouts. Before allowing or denying access, your local authenticating domain controller will first check in with the PDC emulator just to see if anything's changed. But the PDC emulator also serves one other purpose as well. It's the main timekeeper in your forest. That's right, the PDC emulator is responsible for forest-wide time synchronization. Now don't forget, if you have more than one domain in your forest, you'll also have more than one PDC emulator. Now these PDC emulators will synchronize their time with each other. If they don't, then Kerberos authentication will fail. But there is one PDC emulator that's above all of the others, the master of time if you like, and that server is the first PDC emulator installed in the first domain in your forest. All other PDC emulators in each of your domains will synchronize with this server. But as strange as it might sound, this master PDC doesn't have to synchronize with anything. In fact, it doesn't even have to have the right time at all. Although it probably should go without saying that if its time's out of sync, then all of the other PDC emulators will be out as well. So it's a good idea to synchronize your master PDC against a reliable external time source to ensure that it does keep good accurate time. Now one final point is make sure that you set the time zone of each of your domain controllers to the correct time zone. Now if your master PDC happens to be in London and you have domain controllers in New York, if you don't set the time zones to be an accurate depiction of where they're situated geographically and just change the clocks to your local time, then when Active Directory replicates, which it does in universal time by the way, then synchronization will fail as the time is going to be out of whack. Now as this is a domain role, each domain will have a single PDC emulator. So to transfer the PDC emulator role to another server, we'll click on Start, we'll go to Administrative Tools, and we'll launch Active Directory Users and Computers. Now we'll right click on our domain here, winstructorlab.com, and we'll choose change domain controller. Now we're currently connected to DCO1, which holds our PDC emulator role, so we'll connect to DCO2, and we'll click on OK. Now we'll right click on our domain again, winstructorlab.com, and we'll choose operations masters, and then we'll select the PDC tab, and we can see here that the PDC emulator role is being held by DCO1. So to transfer the role to the server that we're currently connected to now, which is DCO2, we'll click on the change button. Are we sure we want to do this? Yes, we are. And the change was successful. And now DCO2 holds the PDC role. The next operations master role we'll look at is the relative identifier or RID. In Windows Server 2000, 2003, or 2008, each domain controller is capable of creating users, groups, and computer accounts. Each account has something called a SID, or a security identifier. Now a SID looks something like this. The first part of the SID, the S-1-5, is a value that applies to all SIDs. The first part of the SID, the S-1, indicates a revision 1 SID, which at this time is the only SID revision to use, 
So up to and including Windows Server 2008, you'll always see S-1 being used, but that might change later on in life with later versions of Windows Server. But for now, it'll always be S-1. The next part, the value of 5, indicates the issuing authority. And this value of 5 always indicates a Windows NT, 2000, 2003 or 2008 domain. So this value will almost always be a 5, except in exceptional circumstances where you might see a 1 or a 0 being used to identify that this is a well-known SID. Now the next section of the SID, the part that forms the majority of the numbers, is a value that identifies which domain this SID belongs to. And since this is such a large number, it's nearly impossible for another account to ever have the same SID as this one. So check out your own in your domain, and you'll see that it'll be different to mine here. Now even if someone over the other side of the world creates an identical domain name and user account as this one, this value should theoretically be impossible to reproduce. The final part of the SID, in this case the value of 500, is a randomly generated relative identifier, or RID. In this case, the value of 500 here indicates that this is the administrator account. But for any new accounts that you create, these accounts will start with a value of something over a thousand. Now you and I really don't see SIDs being thrown around the place too much, since a SID is a behind the scenes way for Windows Server to identify user accounts. Now you and I will see the user account being called names like Bob or Betty or Jack. Windows sees a SID called this whole long number ending with a unique value like 1001, 1002 and 1003. So when your domain controller needs to create a new user account, it already knows what the first part's going to be. It's going to be this part here highlighted in yellow. The only difference is the last part. It's the RID master that's responsible for handing out these relative identifiers to each of your domain controllers. The RID master hands out these RID numbers in batches of 500 to each of your domain controllers. So when your domain controller needs to create a user account, it doesn't need to contact the RID master for a RID that it needs to assign to an account. It already has a whole bunch of them that it can use, and so it just goes on happily creating a unique account. In fact, the RID master can be offline and accounts can still be created. The only time the RID master must be up is when the local domain controller needs to get more RIDs. So when the local domain controller only has about half of its relative IDs left, it'll just contact the RID master and ask for more. If the RID happens to be down and the local domain controller has run out of RIDs, then account creation will fail. Now as the RID master is another domain role, each domain will of course have a single RID master. So to transfer the RID role to another server, we'll click on Start, we'll go to Administrative Tools and we'll launch Active Directory Users and Computers. Then we'll right click on our domain, winstructorlab.com and we'll choose to change domain controller. We're currently connected to DCO1, which holds our RID role at the moment. So we'll connect to DCO2 and we'll click on OK. Now we'll right click on our domain again, winstructorlab.com and we'll select Operations Masters. Now the default tab here is the RID tab, which is what we're looking for. And we can see that the RID role is currently being held by DCO1. So to transfer the role to the server that we're now connected to, which is DCO2, we'll click on Change. Again, are we sure we want to do this? Yes, we are. And we can see the change was successful. Now, by the way, if you're at all interested in finding out what your SID is for your own user account, we'll click on Start and open up a command prompt. And if you simply type in who am I with the slash user switch and hit enter, you're going to see your SID listed here. Now the final operations master role is the infrastructure role. And the infrastructure master is responsible for updating cross domain group to user references. When you change a user account or add a user to a group, these sorts of changes don't tend to show up in other domains for quite a while. So it's the job of the infrastructure master to help speed up this process. 
the Infrastructure Master compares its data against what's stored in the global catalog. If it has outdated data, it updates the data and then replicates it out to the other global catalog servers in the other domains. If the Infrastructure Master is down, these group to name references won't be available and the net result is that when a user's been added to a group that grants them access to a resource in another domain, the likely result is that access will be denied as the target domain has no idea that the user's group membership has changed. Now again, as this is a domain role, each domain will have a single infrastructure master. So to transfer the infrastructure master role to another server, we'll click on Start. We'll go to Administrative Tools and again, we'll launch Active Directory Users and Computers. We'll right click in our domain, winstructorlab.com and we'll choose Change Domain Controller. We're currently connected to DCO1 again, which holds our infrastructure master role at the moment. So we'll connect to DCO2 and we'll click on OK. And now we'll right click again on our domain, winstructorlab.com and we'll choose Operations Masters. And then we'll select the Infrastructure tab. And here we can see that the Infrastructure Master role is being held by DCO1. So to transfer the role to the server that we're now connected to, which is DCO2, we'll click the Change button. Now, are we sure we want to transfer this role? Yes, we are. And we can see that the change again was successful. The other thing you should be aware of regarding the server that holds the infrastructure master role is that whatever server holds the infrastructure master role, it should not be on the same server that's also a global catalog server. The reason for this is that the role of the infrastructure master is to compare objects in the local domain against objects in other domains in the same forest. If the server that's holding the infrastructure master role is also a global catalog server, then it will never see any differences since the global catalog holds a partial reference of every object in the forest. So in this case, the infrastructure master role will never do anything. Now this rule of never put the infrastructure master on the same server that's also a global catalog server is true when you either have multiple domains in the forest or you have domain controllers in a domain that aren't global catalog servers. In these cases, the infrastructure master role should be transferred to a domain controller that's not a global catalog server. The only exceptions to this rule is when you have a single domain forest, in which case the infrastructure master will never do anything anyway, since there's only one domain and it's responsible for cross domain references, which of course it won't need to do if there's only a single domain. The other exception is when you have every single server in the domain that's also a global catalog server. Again, in this situation, the global catalog already knows everything, so the infrastructure master isn't required. So there we have the five different operations master roles available in Windows 2008. It's important to understand the importance that each role plays in your environment as each can affect the successful operation of your network in their own way if they're not available. Transferring a role to another server is a painless operation as you've seen, and it should be transferred wherever possible when you anticipate downtime. On the other hand, seizing a role is a drastic measure and it should only be attempted when the server that's currently holding a role is beyond repair and you never plan on reintroducing it into your network. Operations masters are critical to the smooth running of your network. I encourage you to find out which servers in your network hold these roles and understand what they do and plan around how you'll handle the smooth